Welcome to Harnessing RNAi Nanomedicine for Manipulating Lymphocyte Function. My name is Dana Vasselman and I'm the Nano Assembler Product Manager at Dr. Golic Scientific Solutions. As Dr. Golic is the sole representative of Precision Nanosystems in Israel, I would like to just say a few words about us. Dr. Golic is an Israeli exclusive representative of 20 leading global instrumentation brands in the fields of analytical chemistry, organic chemistry, and biophysical characterization of particles and materials. Our services include sales and marketing of advanced solutions, together with post-sales services that include technical support, application consultancy, and user training and qualification. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Professor Dan Pierre leads an NIH-funded lab in the Faculty of Life Science and the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. He is also the director of the Focal Technology Area of Nanomedicines for Personalized Theranostics and National Nanotechnology Initiative, and the director of the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Nanotechnology Research Fund. His work was among the first to demonstrate systemic delivery of RNA molecules using targeted nanocarriers to the immune system, and he pioneered the use of RNA interference for in vivo validation of new drug targets within the immune system. He generated an international recognition and collaboration in inflammatory bowel diseases and oncology area, in blood cancers, brain and ovarian cancers. He received numerous awards. Among them, he was recognized by the American Association for Advancement of Science Excellence in Science Program for Young Investigators and was recently awarded the Innovator and the Breakthrough Awards from the Kenneth Reining Foundation on his pioneering work in inflammatory bowel diseases. Professor Peer is the president of the Israeli chapter of the Controlled Release Society and a member of the Israel Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Professor Peer has more than 45 pending and granted patents. Some of them have been licensed to several pharmaceutical companies and one is under a phase 3 clinical evaluation. In addition, based on his work, three spin-off companies were generated. Luco Bioscience, Quiet Therapeutics, and ESPL Pharma, aiming to bring nanomedicine into clinical practice. Thank you, Dana, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about our work. So our lab is studying how to manipulate cellular function in order to generate novel therapeutic approaches to treat mainly leukocytes implicated diseases. And this is a huge field that includes blood cancer, inflammation, and viral infection. And basically, there are several conventional techniques to study gene function in order to decipher gene function. And they could go from in vitro to cell culture and mouse model. But these are long, laborious, and very expensive techniques. The introduction and the discovery of RNA interference uh, in C. elegans, and then by the group of Thomas Tischel, uh, the um, discovery that RNAi can operate in mammalian cells opened really a huge opportunity from drug discovery to new therapeutic modality. And all the way we have realized that we need to understand the major delivery issues coming from the properties, the physical chemical properties of the RNAi molecules. And as we all know, these are huge challenges that need to be overcome. So as an example, I'll talk a little bit about siRNA delivery carrier requirements, but in fact, this will be joined by any type of RNAi-based or RNA-based drugs, such as microRNA and modified messenger RNA, coding and non-coding long or short RNAs. So efficient encapsulation is the first really important property that I would say orchestrate the entire field. And then remember we are trying to manipulate leukocytes in general and lymphocytes in particular. So basically evading clearance mechanism and avoiding toxicity and immune activation or also immune suppression 
are very important when you try to deliver nucleic acid into leukocytes. In addition, specificity is very important. And this is true for any targeted delivery platform, but in particular, cells that uh, actually are circulating cells and have different roles and could be primed into differentiation in different direction are much more sensitive because as you probably all know, lymphocytes as an example, have a very defined role in protecting the body from invaders, uh, external and in internal invaders, and therefore the manipulation and the penetration of foreign materials such as, or exogenous materials such as nucleic acid, should be very sensitive. So carrier internalization and endosomal escape are actually a must in the system, and we have learned, well, not in a very nice manner over the years, that these are huge challenges because lymphocytes are notoriously hard to transfect cells, and more particularly with RNA-based strategies, uh, they are much more, I would say, resistant to transfection in a lipid-based scheme or in a polymer-based scheme uh, compared to other cell types. How we construct those lipid-based nanoparticles? Over the past 25 years, there have been lots of effort to synthesize new cationic formulations, new cationic lipids that are completely non-natural and condense nucleic acid, starting with plasmid DNA, fragments of DNA, and over the past uh, 10 years, different types of nucleic acid from the RNA family, mostly siRNAs. But the introduction of ionizable lipids, such as the d lean DMA family, provide a new opportunity of real condensations. Those lipids are really unique because they actually um, are charged in a mildly acetic pH and highly charged, and they condense nucleic acid. Then by changing the pH, you're actually creating an assembly process that on the surface is now, mm, I would say, close to um, or, or neutral in charge, or close to neutral in charge. And this process endow for efficient encapsulation of the nucleic acid and endow also or help or aid with the endosomal re release. And to some extent, we have found that in particular, the d MC3 DMA molecule could avoid toxicity and immune activation in lymphocytes. So using this really interesting technology that makes our life amazingly easier, the nanoassembler, okay, we can mix siRNAs at a low pH, such as pH 4, with ionizable lipids and other lipids, and you can see on your left side the compound and the molar percentage. So the ionizable lipids comprise on almost 50% or 50% of this formulation, cholesterol and dye rigidity, a little bit of PC, uh, PEG DMG, that the release will be very close proximity to the cells, and PEG malamide because we are going to bind a targeting agent. And we have, using uh, those nano assembler, we get a very robust production of tiny lipid-based nanoparticles. Over the past year, we've published several papers uh, that describe the technology and how it can aid when we then move to decorating the surface of those nanoparticles, lipid-based nanoparticles, with targeting moiety that can direct them to cell-specific type of cells. So the production of the targeted lipid-based nanoparticles is mixing an siRNA as a low pH with a lipids mixture with malamide and ethanol, mixing them, injecting them to the nanoassembler, then dialyze them at uh, a neutral pH. And then if you need a targeting agent, uh, such a monoclonal antibody, you can reduce it and then attach it to the surface. Here, this is a malamide chemistry. And then at the end, you need to get rid of unbound monoclonal antibody using gel filtration column, and you can collect the monoclonal targeted 
lipid-based nanoparticles with sRNA inside, and then you can perform validation, specificity, and efficiency. And I'm going to give you two examples today, one on T-cells and the other one on malignant B-cells, that this technology could really, really make uh, a big change in this production. The first story is SRNA delivery to target CD4 T-cells, and this is basically still a work in progress. Some was published, some was not yet. Um, and the idea, we have made two types of lipid-based nanoparticle, one have on the surface an anti-CD4, and the other one an isotype control that do not <laughs> recognize any specific target. We inject them intravenously into C57 uh, mice, and an hour later, we can actually uh, see if those cells reach their target. We can do a live uh, single cell from the splint, and then look at CD3, um, which are actually all T cells, and we can differentiate between CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And what we have found that systemically we can target very efficiently only CD4 cells, okay, with the targeted CD4s. We do not target CD8 or CD3 minus, it means everything but leukocytes, but lymphocytes, sorry. Isotype control do not target any type of uh, CD4, CD3, or CD3 minus or CD8. And mock treated cells do not target anything. So it's very, very specific. And in this example, we entrap Psi5 siRNAs. Um, in the next step, what we have done is to look at silencing, systemic silencing. And for this, we have prepared four different formulations. Uh, we use a surrogate marker, the common leukocytes common antigen, CD45. And it's easy because it's easy to do qPCR on this and most easy to do flow cytometry. So we entrap the in the CD4 targeted lipid-based nanoparticle SI against CD45, isotope control entrapping SI CD45, CD4 entrapping SI luciferase, which is an irrelevant siRNA, or just lipid-based nanoparticles without any coating <coughs> with SI against CD45. Five days later, we isolate after a single injection IV, we isolate the cells and actually did a live single cell to look at the expression level. And we have found that in a very specific manner, only the CD4 targeted lipid-based nanoparticles have been silenced CD45. So only this one, Okay, and you can see the level of silencing is not huge, but it's specific. If you look with, uh, compared to just lipid-based nanoparticles, again, silencing CD45, we have not observed any silencing. Basically, very similar to mock-treated, similar to isotype-based uh, nanoparticles. And if we look at the CD4-targeted lipid-based nanoparticle with luciferase, again, there is no silencing. So the silencing is specific, but the question is, what are the amounts of silencing? What is the level of silencing? Before that, we also wanted to look which cells are silenced. And when we did it, we basically gated that among the CD3 family, all, almost 100%, 99.8 of the silenced cells are CD4. So it's a very, very specific silencing. We then wanted to probe for silencing efficacy in hematopoietic tissues. Again, a single IV injection of those particles, and we isolated spleen, lymph nodes, bone marrow, and blood. And what you can see that when we gate for live um, single cells, CD3 positive, CD4 positive, the level of silencing goes from 24 to a maximum of 35 it's not huge, but definitely there is a robust shift of the population. And the question is, why? <laughs> so, do we have now a strategy to specifically silence CD4 T-cells? 
IV administrated strategy and is the level of silencing is enough to get a therapeutic benefit. When we did this experiment, we actually found that there are two levels of CD4. There is CD4 high and CD4 low. Basically, when the lipid-based nanoparticles are interacting with the cell membrane, they can either penetrate, and now when they penetrate, the level of CD4 on the surface is low. However, if they interact with their surface and we come with a secondary antibody, we can actually observe a population that have CD4 high. Those cells are basically the CD4 high represent particles that stick to the outer layer of the membrane and not penetrating. And one of the questions was, is it correlating? Is the low expressing CD4 silencing better than the high expressing CD4. The hypothesis that we have was that indeed lower level of CD4 uh, expressing cells have also induced a more robust silencing in vivo. And it's a very logical uh, concept. So what we have done is to check this. Before that we wanted to see if CD4 shedding and internalization occur and we really found that <coughs> Interization is occur. You can actually see this here that the level of CD uh, Si5 sRNA is going down, okay, in this population. So it means that the hypothesis potentially is true, but we wanted to see if the silencing is true. We also did some confocal analysis and found that the lower CD4 uh, cells expressing very nicely in confocal, we can actually image them and can see the particles inside the cells. Now, for testing the hypothesis, we had to perform the following experiment. We have prepared CD4 targeted lipid-based nanoparticles in trapping uh, sRNA, for example, against CD45 or isotype control, injected IV, an hour later isolate the spleen, then do a single cell suspension, use a cell sorter, and then culture the cells for three days and then look at the silencing analysis. And this experimental design was performed and we found where in good agreement with our hypothesis is that first there are two population of CD4, CD4 high and CD4 low. The CD4 low population silence almost 70% of the cells, where the CD4 high population silence only 16%. It means that the hypothesis, and if we look in an isotype control, that in both cases silence only 1.4%. If we look at a normalized figure on the right side of the uh, panel here, we can see the percent of silent cells. And again, CD4 high silence about 20%, and these are normalized to different experiments. The low almost 60% and isotype almost nothing. So it's a very specific and we know that there are two population. What are these two population? I can hint because these are experiments are done now that uh, with RNA-seq we get really interesting phenotype. The second story I would like to uh, tell you about are on mantle cell lymphoma. This is a very aggressive form of B-cell malignancy, and there are about 20 different B-cell malignancies. This is one of the, I would say, most aggressive and very rare. It has a low incidence, about one, maximum two cases out of 100,000 per year, represents 6 to 9% of the total non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, it has a rate for 3 to 1, men to women, median age of 16, and now median survival that is between five to seven years, which is dramatically increased over the past few years that was one to three years. <coughs> and we're talking about mature B cells that host the mantle zone. Um, and it has in 85% of the patient, a very unique hallmark, genetic hallmark, which the gene encodes for cyclin D1, CCN D1, chunk depose into the Ig heavy chain that has a very strong promoter. 
This chromosomal translocation that is known as T1114 produces constitutively cyclin D1. And this overexpression of cyclin D1 in, norm, in, in, in normal B cells forms them into a very malignant characteristic of cells because they're now producing and proliferating all the time. Normal B cells, even when they activated, they do not upregulate cyclin D1. They could upregulate cyclin D2 or D3, but not D1. So this chromosomal aberration, it's only a first out of a lot of secondary chromosomal aberration that's happening. But the unique hallmark of this disease is that it has a really unique genetic profile. 85% of the patient have this overexpression of cyclin D1 with two transcripts, short and long. <coughs> the conventional therapy that is given to those patients nowadays are chemotherapy cocktails, mostly. In some cases, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, rituximab or rituxam, and protosome and BCR pathway inhibitors such as the new uh, FDA-approved drug ibrutinib. So this BCR or, or BTK inhibitor uh, made substantial effect on those patients and increased dramatically the survival. However, still, mantle cell lymphoma is considered a non-curable disease. So we thought that if this has a genetic profile, maybe we can develop siRNA against cyclin D1. And we have been working with cyclin D1 for many, many years, and this was part of the collaboration we had with Alnylon Pharmaceuticals. We have screened many types of sequences that target both the long and short transcript, and we did a lot of bioinformatic chemistry and a lot of electroporation. At the end, we found <coughs> several sequences that robustly silence in electroporation cyclin D1 in cell lines, and also basically um, block the cell cycle at G1, G0. So they actually perform in their role. They also produce apoptosis, both early and late apoptosis, but this time takes, this effect takes more time and sometimes there is a need for additional transfection or electroporation. <coughs> Therapeutic gene silencing of cyclin D1 in mantle cell lymphoma is a big challenge. Electroporation definitely is not the right or appropriate clinical uh, modality. So the challenges is, of course, that sRNA needs protection, that these sRNAs must be directed towards the tumor cell cytoplasm, that B lymphocytes, as I mentioned to other lymphocytes, are notoriously resistant to transfection, and one question we always have is, does efficient transfection generate a therapeutic phenotype? So again, with the nanoassembler, we have used the same technique and the same formulation, and this time basically ask with the very um, robust particles without any coating, any decoration on the surface, does those lipid-based nanoparticles induce gene silencing in mantle cell lymphoma cell line. So we have uh, basically transfect the cell line and we have found that about 60% knockdown of cyclin D1 at the messenger level was expressed, was, was uh, performed <laughs> compared to luciferas or amok treated, and that this knockdown translated to cell cycle arrest, the G1, G0 um, checkpoint. Now, providing targeting capability to lipid-based nanoparticles is a huge challenge. The advantage is that it can increase the sRNA concentration in the tumor cells, and it can reduce off-target effects. And we have actually decided to create, to generate criteria for receptor targets. They should be highly or differentially expressed on target cells and the binding shall be followed by efficient internalization. That's essential, and it has to be fast. We have screened different cell lines and screened different targets. Among the targets we have screened was CD22, 
LFA1, the integrin, also known as alpha L beta 2 integrin, and CD38. And we have found that CD38 actually could be a very interesting target because it's highly expressed in all four cell lines that we have actually checked and also primary cells. So um, just to show you again that anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody really binds very well to different uh, cell types and that if we inject systemically an anti-CD38 to xenograft of granta expressing GFP, which is a mantle cell lymphoma cell line, we can actually isolate about 50% of the injected dose in the bone marrow. So, and that if we sort the cells, we can actually see those uh, internalizing. So the confocal image basically is human cells that have been sorted and we can actually see the high expression of the uh, CD38 monoclon and that it's actually those cells are inside the, those uh, antibodies are inside the cells. <coughs> so the next step was, can we conjugate them to the surface of the lipid-based nanoparticle? And we use a malamide chemistry, which is, you know, very classical. And again, for this process, uh, after having a purified version we have decided to test binding and specificity in vitro. We created a co-culture system. We have a human, granta, basically a mantle cell lymphoma cell line expressing constitutively GFP, eGFP, TK1 mouse cell line, and a marine T lymphoma that do not express CD38. And we basically did flow cytometry with entrapped siRNA with Alexa 647, as you can see here, the granta cells expressing GFP is highly expressing uh, and highly binding to the uh, anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal uh, antibody coated uh, lipid-based nanoparticles, whereas the TK1, they're not binding. We also looked at isotype control particles and we saw reduction in the binding. And we also did competition. We block with free monoclonal antibody against CD38 and so reduction in the binding. That means that the process itself is directed through the uh, CD38 or mediated through the CD38. We also did some uh, cellular uptake assays with an anti-CD38 uh, lipid-based nanoparticles in MCL cells. And we have found that those particles penetrate very nicely into mantle cell lymphoma cells, where isotype control on uncoated particles under flow condition do not bind or internalize. Next, we looked at silencing in vitro. And basically in a cell line, we have shown that uh, those particles can silence cycling D1. When we then move to primary cells, and as you know, different patients have different profile, but all in patient are CD19, CD5 positive patients. CD5 is a marker for T cells, CD19 for B cells, but in many B cell hematological malignancies, there is a joint marker, CD19, CD5, and you can see two different patients, and they have, as you can see, different profile. So, when we incubate with a sample from patient 3, for example, we have looked at anti-CD38 particle binding, and we have found that it can bind to CD19, but not to CD negative, uh, CD19 positive, but not to CD19 negative cells. And if we look at isotype control, there is dramatic reduction. And if we now block and do a competition assay, there is a more robust Okay, so it's apparently very efficient. And then when we look at silencing in primary T cells, again, different patients provide different level of silencing. Then we thought, well, we need to show this in vivo, right? So we have looked for mantle cell lymphoma xenograft mouse model. Apparently, all the models that we have found were sub-Q models. So basically, you take the cells, you take a skid or a nude or a rag mouse, and you now implant those subcutaneously. But then there is no real microenvironment. So we decided that we take the granted GFP cells 
and inject them IV. <coughs> so we use a Skid CB17 background mice that do not need irradiation and injected IV the granted GFP. Symptomatic manifestation were observed between 24 to 30 days and the cells accumulated mainly in the bone marrow. So if you look at liver, lung, spleen, blood, and we have done flow cytometry to two markers, GFP, which are the grant uh, cells, and CD45, which is a human marker for leukocytes. So we have found them predominantly in the bone marrow. In addition, when we did histology, you can actually see the grant of 519 on the left side, down, you can actually see the tumors that is within the cells, within the, sorry, within the bone area. And if you look at the normal one, it seems very nice. But the tumor cells create a cluster, actually a very big tumor, that pushes out everything that the bone marrow have and fill it with tumors. And if we do PCR on this, we still recognize it. Or if we do flow cytometry on bone marrow cells after a single cell suspension, we can actually identify those cells. So we had a model, and now we can do an experiment, basically testing their efficacy. But before going to the efficacy, we wanted to do some binding in vivo. So we injected those particles IV, two types of particles, isotype control particles, and anti-CD38 particles. When we inject them and we look at the percent or, or the fold of cells positive for sRNA prepared uh, to muck treated cells, we have found a robust accumulation of the particles, uh, again CD38, uh, in the human mantle cell lymphoma. There is a minor uptake but is existing uh, in the mouse version also because probably due to FC receptors and if we look at isotype control uh, particle there there is no specific uptake basically so encouraged from this we decided to do now an efficacy experiment the experiment was done blinded and the idea was that three groups will be injected and you can see there are many many uh, types of injection each error represent IV injection 10 mice per group and we injected anti-CD38 nanoparticles entrapping SI ruciferase and anti-CD38 nanoparticles entrapping SI cyclin D1. And we found that we can prolong the survival dramatically. However, it's a very devastating disease. They will die. So a single sRNA apparently, even against cyclin D1, and this is one of our conclusion, is not enough. Combination therapy is probably something that needs to be done. <coughs> Our take-home message is quite simple. The use of microfluidic mixers, such as the nanoassembler, enable improved entrapment of RNA molecules. And these are different types of sRNAs, microRNAs, and modified messenger RNA. Novel delivery strategies are being developed in order to achieve a better active cellular targeting. And again, it's all in the message. I'm very helpful, I'm very thankful for the people from my group who did the work, our collaborator from Shiba Tel Shomer Hospital and from Rabin Medical Center Hospital, the funding agents that help us and the entire group that we have that is actively working, that's very slow, actively working in the field of RNA uh, and novel therapeutic modalities in leukocytes. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to present some of our work.